This week's uh, Sicha talk that the Rebbe gave is a combination actually of two talks. It's a talk that the Rebbe gave in 1954, as well as a talk that the Rebbe gave in 1968. And it's going to be a combination, a fascinating combination of uh, a, a, a Talmudic uh, study and analyzation, because this talk actually was also given as a siyum, as a hadron, as a completion of the study of the tractate of Sukkah. Um, and um, so it's going to also blend Talmudic ideas in the beginning, and then we're going to conclude with how these Talmudic ideas also express themselves on a spiritual level. So let's begin with a verse which is in this week's Torah portion. And that is where the Torah says, Vasisa hayosher v'hatoyv b'ini Hashem. That you should do that which is right and good in the eyes of God. Now, what exactly does this mean? So the Talmud actually learns from this a law known as the law of Bar Metzra. Bar Metzra means one who is a neighbor, shares a borderline. A property, line, a property line. And the law is, as the Talmud tells us, and as the Rambam also writes in his uh, book of laws, that if, um, I ha- if someone has a neighbor, I, uh, they, they have a field, and they have a neighbor with a neighboring field, and um, they want to sell their field to a buyer, and a buyer comes and he buys the field. Being that the neighbor would benefit much more than the buyer uh, with with having this field that was just sold, because when all of your fields are together, it's it's a tremendous convenience and uh, and and benefit. And the buyer came from somewhere somewhere else and just bought this field. So the law of bar mitzvah is that you have to do that which is right and that which is good in the eyes of God, and therefore you have to sell it. The buyer has to sell it to the neighbor. He cannot keep it. He has, of course, assuming that the neighbor wants to buy it, then he has to sell it to the, to the neighbor. Um, and this is uh, very clearly, as the Rebbe um, explains, a, an instruction to the buyer. In other words, it's not an instruction to the seller. It's an instruction to the buyer. The seller ha- owns a property. He's allowed to sell it to whoever he wants. However, a buyer needs to be sensitive to the neighbor's. And if a neighbor wants to buy it, he has to give him first right of refusal, as we would say. And if not, he has to then sell it to the neighbor if the neighbor wants to buy it from him. And the Talmud said, goes on to say, and what happens if a Gentile bought it? So a Gentile, being that the responsibility is on the buyer to deal with doing the right and good thing and making sure that the neighbor gets first rights, and a Gentile is not beholden to the laws of the Torah. So therefore, um, he's not obligated to sell the field. If the buyer was a Gentile, the Gentile is not obligated to sell the field to uh, the neighbor. The Rambam writes that that then the seller in that case would have certain responsibilities for having put the neighbor into a certain position, um, etc. So that is the law of bar mitzvah, one who is a neighbor, that they have first rights um, to the field. And if someone else buys it, then the buyer has to give it to the to the neighbor. So the Rebbe now goes into, puts on a scholar, a Talmudic hat, which I'm going to ask you to do as well. And it begins to break down the, the reason for this law of Bar Mitzvah, the nuanced reason. And we're going to see, and this is one of the gifts of this uh, of this talk that we're going through t- uh, today, is that you're going to be able to see how these nuances play a, a great significance in, in many laws, as the Rebbe is going to demonstrate in many laws in the Torah. Um, and so the Rebbe explains that this, this idea of bar mitzvah can be defined, it can be understood in two different ways. One is, it's strictly just and proper conduct. Um, the purchase that the buyer bought from the seller was, was a 100% sound legal purchase. However, the Chachamim, the sages, said that this would not be proper and just and good um, in the eyes of, the, on behalf of the neighbor. And therefore, even though you have a legal sale, a legal purchase, and you purchased it, and that's fine. 
but still it is incumbent upon you to hold yourself to a higher standard so much so that the sages say that we have implemented as a law that you have to hold yourself to this standard in this case and therefore you need to sell it to the neighbor if the neighbor wants to feel that is one way of understanding this law of bar mitzvah there's another way of understanding the law of bar mitzvah and the other way of understanding it is that when some two people are neighbors the very fact that they are neighbors automatically gives the neighbor some form of attachment to their neighbor's field even though it's not theirs and and therefore they have some form of ownership on the field it would, it, it would be the, the the thought that came to me was it's sort of like they have a lien on their neighbor's field that if the neighbor wants to sell it that and they sell it to someone else that the neighbor being that they already have legal some form of legal ownership to it that perhaps in the form of a lien type style ownership therefore they can come and say no you can't you, you bought it but you have to sell it to me because i already have some rights to it so so the, the, the first approach is that the is that the neighbor has no rights to and no legal rights to it and therefore um th- therefore we, we go to the uh, purchaser to the buyer and we tell the buyer that the, the the neighbor has no legal rights to come and take it from you but you have a moral obligation which is a moral obligation which we're going, we're going to hold you up to to actually give it to the neighbor now, if the, if the buyer says, no, I don't want to, so then simply because the, the buyer is not fulfilling their responsibility, the court will come in, the, the Besdin, the court will come in, and they're going to get involved to make sure that the buyer sells it to the neighbor. Whereas the second approach that we, that, that we explained, where the buyer, where the neighbor actually has some form of ownership, even though it's a minimal form and a subtle form of ownership on their neighbor's field in the sense that um, that they actually have, it belongs to them on some level. And therefore, when the buyer buys it, um, the neighbor can come and say, I already have some form of ownership to it. You, and therefore, um, it has to be given to me. In that case, it's not the onus of transferring ownership from the buyer to the neighbor is not simply on the buyer. It's actually on the court because it's a legal matter now. It's not just a moral matter, which we're going to uphold the buyer to, but it's actually a legal matter. And the Rebbe explains that, in fact, we find that if we analyze how Rashi, who's a commentator, um, the the primary commentator on the Talmud, um, explains this law, and we analyze how Rambam, Maimonides, explains this law, we will notice that from the way they word things, that Rashi actually is of the opinion that this is all a matter of proper conduct. There's, it's, not a, it's not a matter of legalities uh, of, of ownership. And the Rambam is of the opinion that actually the neighbor has some form of ownership um, on, the, on the property. And that's why Rashi says um, that he, he, his whole explanation to this law of, of the neighbor having first rights is that there's not much of a loss for the buyer to buy a field somewhere else. He doesn't, there's not, uh, it's not a big loss for him, but for the neighbor, it would be a big loss if the neighbor wanted to expand his, um, you know, his, his, his fields. And now he's going to have to go buy a field that's three blocks down instead of having a field that's right next to his first field, which makes it much easier to work, to work everything together. That would be a big loss for him. So therefore, he says it's not proper. And that's the, that's the expression of the verse that we have in, in this week's Torah portion, that you should do that which is right and that which is good. But the Rambam doesn't focus on, you see, the, the Rashi focuses on the buyer. His entire commentary is about the buyer. That buyer, this isn't right of you, because for you it's not a big loss to go get another field. Go get another field. Let the neighbor have this field. But the Rambam focuses entirely on the neighbor, not on the buyer. And, and, and the Rambam says that a neighbor uh, can pay off the buyer. Um, and because it, and it's proper that the neighbor gets it over the more distant field. So he's clearly focusing on the neighbor and not on the buyer. Because he's saying that the neighbor has legal rights to it. So the focus is much more on the fact that I am the neighbor and I have legal rights and therefore, buyer, you have to sell it to me. Whereas Rashi is saying, 
It has nothing to do with the neighbor. The neighbor has no, no legal rights to it. But you buyer shouldn't be buying a field when you know there's a neighbor right next door who can benefit much more greatly from this field and they want the field and therefore we hold you we uh, we, we we hold you up to the moral standard of of giving it to them of being a a good and right person um <clears throat> so so what we're seeing is that there are two ways of understanding the the, the how this law of bar mitzvah functions and we actually see that rashi and rambam differ in in exactly how um how it functions, their belief of how it functions. Now, the rabbi says there are many concepts and laws in Torah that at first glance are not don't seem to be associated at all. However, if we look more deeply, we understand it more, the roots of these laws, the, the the foundational concept that the law is built on. Then we can the, the, um, then we can begin to see how this concept actually plays out in many laws. In other words, the more we get to the root understanding of what drives a certain law. So we're no longer understanding the law as it is for this particular law. We're understanding the root behind the foundation upon which this law stands. And that foundation is upon what many laws stands. And, and what's interesting is that the, the deeper one can understand the, the root um, uh, causes of, uh, or reasonings for all different types of laws, the, the, the more we begin to see that there are some very, very root ideas upon which many, many laws stand, and that there's a unity amongst many laws because they're all founded really on some, some common principles. So um, the rabbi uses this as an example, um, and, and the rabbi says the one, who, one, one great uh, sage, uh, Gaon, a, a genius um, rabbi who, who uh, spent time demonstrating this was the rugged Shavar Gain, and it so happens that the Rebbe speaks much uh, of the rugged Shavar Gain's uh, teachings because, um, um, possibly because, uh, the Rebbe received smicha from the rugged Shavar. The Rebbe has uh, many, uh, many letters uh, written back and forth to him of great scholarship, um, and the Rebbe appreciated his uh, style of learning very much. So, um, so, he, so, so, he, so, so the Rebbe explains this, that at the root of the the uh, the debate, if you will, or the or, or the the two approaches as to the laws of, uh, as to the meaning of bar, the law of bar mitzvah, as Rashi sees it and as Rambam sees it, is to bring it even to a deeper root understanding. Um, it's not just a matter of whether it's 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 um, a claim of the neighbor or it's a responsibility of the buyer, but the reason what compels the either it being a responsibility of the buyer or a claim of the neighbor is in understanding of what neighborliness causes or creates which is very interesting and that is that the rambam is of the opinion that when two people are neighbors that neighborliness the, the, the fact that they are neighbors they're physically neighbors that automatically creates a deep connection between the two people not only just a deep connection but we're going to see that it plays out on many on a number of levels but it plays out even on a legal level that the very fact that we are neighbors means that there is that that we have a now a deeper connection based on the fact that we are neighbors and so much so that i even have a certain claim to your property where you two to decide to sell it that i already have some level of ownership to it whereas rashi says no two neighbors are neighbors and their relationship now is a relatively external relationship. It's not a deep relationship. It's an external relationship. And it's external to the extent that the, that the neighbor doesn't have any right to their neighbor's property that they're selling. It's just that it happens to be convenient, because it, which is an external expression, it, which is an external thing. It happens to be convenient that the two fields are, that this field that's being sold is next to mine. Be convenient for me. So therefore, for a more external reason, um, there's benefit, and therefore we tell the buyer um, that he has to give it to the neighbor. It's not that the neighbor himself has a right to it, because the neighbor doesn't have a deep connection to the field. But it's the right thing for the buyer to do. So Rashi sees neighbor that, 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 that when two people are neighbors, their, their relationship is, is a relatively shallow an external relationship, but there is a connection between the two, by if, if only by mere geographical 
uh, association and loca- uh, you know, and location, benefit of location. And, and, and the Rambam sees it as that there's a deep connection. And therefore, I actually have an ownership. And so he, the Rebbe explains that this difference relates to a number of neighborly situations. And we know in general that everything we experience in this world, we experience always um, three-dimensionally because there are three dimensions that always come together whenever something is happening. So, for example, I'm teaching this class now. So, the, the three dimensions that are coming together right now are the dimension of space. I'm right here. I'm right here. So, I'm in a very defined space. And in this space is also joining together with this time, this very time that I am speaking. So, it's a particular time and a particular space. So there's a dimension of time that's merging with the dimension of space. And then there's a dimension of what we call in Hebrew soul, which I would say maybe is consciousness, which is the human who's experiencing it or participating in it right now, which is me being consumed in the ideas of this talk, of, of this talk of the Rebbe's. So these three dimensions come together. So the Rebbe says, I'm going to demonstrate to you how we have this idea of neighborliness show up in scenarios which relate to all three dimensions and how this debate plays out in all three di- in, 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 in the way neighborliness shows up in all three dimensions. Now, the dimension of space we just discussed. You have one field, another field. It's all talking about the dimension of space. One field next to another field. And we discussed how, according to Rambam, the, uh, the, 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 um, the neighbor has a claim to that property. According to Rashi, the neighbor doesn't have a claim to the property, but the buyer is responsible to, to give it to the neighbor, to sell it to the neighbor. So now we're going to demonstrate a scenario, the Rebbe says, of time. Where do we see this in time? So very interestingly, um, we know that the, the Torah, there's a biblical commandment, a mitzvah, that for Yom Kippur, to make sure to add a few minutes to Yom Kippur before Yom Kippur starts and add a few minutes after Yom Kippur ends. We call it Teisvis uh, Yom Kippur, which means adding to the holiday. That even though the holiday begins at a particular time and it ends at a particular time, a very exact time to the minute, we have a mitzvah to begin the Yom Tiv a few minutes earlier. Generally, we light Yom Tiv candles 18 minutes before and we have, a, we have a mitzvah to also extend the Yom Tiv by a few minutes. And this way we're extending the holiness of this fixed time, uh, of, of the exact minute it begins, the exact minute it ends. We're extending it now into the mundane week, so we're spreading the holiness to the mundane week. This is true not only for Yom Kippur, it's true for Shabbos and for Yom Tiv. Even though there's debate regarding Shabbos and Yom Tiv about whether that's a biblical mitzvah or a rabbinic mitzvah, but regardless, it is a mitzvah for us to extend and lengthen Shabbos and Yom Tiv, so we're adding holiness to the Monday. So we're taking a zone of holy time, and we're extending it to bring, to add holiness to um, time which would otherwise be mundane time. Now, what, what do we see? We have neighbors. We have, we have um, holy time, that's neighbors with mundane time, both at the outset of Shabbos and both at, the, both at the conclusion of Shabbos. And the question is, what relationship do these two time zones have? So um, <clears throat> Rashi would say it's an external relationship. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing deep and profound about this relationship. They happen to be next to each other. So therefore, Rashi would say that, um, as Rashi says, that a person should add to the time of Shabbos. And what's he going to do during that time? Um, in other words, what, what is the significance of adding to the time of Shabbos? That he can now no longer do things which are forbidden to be done on Shabbos. Because even though the time itself of Friday and Shabbos is not inherently connected, there's no deep connection just because they're neighbor, they, they neighbor each other. However, we still encourage the person that he should extend from the holiness of Shabbos to the weekday, and therefore he starts Shabbos a few minutes earlier, which would mean that he wouldn't be able to do uh, the things, different things that you're not allowed to do on Shabbos, because he's extending it to, to, to these uh, minutes of Friday, which are Monday. But Rambam would say differently. Rambam would say there's a deep connection between the two. The fact that they're neighbors means that Shabbos actually owns some of the time of Friday, which means that the time of Friday already has an element of connection to Shabbos, 
And therefore, we are telling the Shabbos neighbor, grab this time of Friday, which belongs to you, and include it in your level of holiness. Now, you may be wondering, what is the difference between these two? The end result is the same. So the Rebbe explains that the end result is not the same. Why is it not the same? Because there's a big debate in the halacha. There's a big debate in the halacha that if someone, let's just say that Shabbos starts at 7 p.m. That's on the clock when Shabbos starts. And someone says, I'm going to start Shabbos. I'm going to begin Shabbos earlier to, to fulfill this mitzvah of Teisvah Shabbos, of adding to Shabbos. So we'll start at 6.30. So he starts at 6.30 and he wants to make Kiddush at 6.45. There's a debate in halacha whether one's allowed to make Kiddush then, because it's not actually the, the, the actual time of Shabbos yet, according to the clock. It's only because this person added to Shabbos. Is he allowed to make Kiddush during that time or not? He's allowed to do the mitzvah of sanctifying Shabbos during that time. So there are some who say that one cannot make Kiddush then. You have to wait until 7. And some people say you can make Kiddush. What, what is the root of underlying their opinions. The root underlying their opinions is this very matter that we're talking about, about how strong neighbors are connected to each other. Rambam would say, you can make Kiddush at 645. It's fine to make Kiddush at 645. Why? Because Shabbos already has a relationship and even an ownership to the time, to some time before Shabbos. So therefore, when a person starts Shabbos beforehand, it's not just them saying, I am going to observe Shabbos um, during this time, but it's, it, it's, it's not just coming from the person himself, it's coming from the time zone itself, a Friday, saying, I belong to Shabbos, I have a relationship with Shabbos. And therefore, Shabbos, all Shabbos matters can be done now. Whereas Rashi would say, and, and this is where the other opinions get their opinion that you cannot make Kiddush, they say, no, during this time, you can extend Shabbos so that you want to observe not doing the things that you don't do on Shabbos, beautiful. It's a form of extending Shabbos. But to come and say that, that these minutes of Friday are now Shabbos, so much so that you can go and express all the ex expressions of Shabbos, that you can't say, because that connection is not such a deep connection. So now we're seeing how this idea of Bar Metzra, of neighbors, which shows up in laws regarding two people of neighboring fields, suddenly shows up in regards to the laws re regarding Shabbos and the weekday, and the arguments in, Jew in, in Jewish law about whether one's allowed to make Kiddush during this extended time or not. Fascinating. And it all comes down to the root, which is, what is the relationship between neighbors? Is it a deep relationship? That the fact that we're neighbors means that we have a deep connection to each other now, which would say, I can make Kiddush now, even though it's not technically on the clock Shabbos, or we had just have external connection. It's more of a superficial connection, a circumstantial connection. And therefore, I wouldn't be able to make Kiddush until Shabbos actually begins on the clock um, for everyone. Now the Rabbi uses another example. Another example is the third dimension. The third dimension is the dimension of soul or consciousness or human experience. And, and the Rebbe goes to a, to a Mishnah, which is the last Mishnah in Tractate Sukkah, which is why the Rebbe spoke about this in his making a siyum, concluding the study of Tractate Sukkah. He studied the last segment, a Mishnah and Gemara and Talmud of, the, of, uh, of Sukkah. And the Mishnah says that there, we know that there were 24 Mishmaris. That means that there were 24 watchings which really means that there were 24 groups, kohanim, of, of priests. The kohanim were the ones who did the service in the temple. They were the ones who brought the sacrifices and ran all of the service in the temple. And so all the kohanim were split into 24 different groups. And each group would serve two weeks a year, which gave you, eight, which gave you 48 weeks of service. And then there were the, 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 the remaining four weeks were made up of holidays, where all kohanim had the right to, 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 to serve in the temple. So every mishmar... Every watch, every one of the 24 mishmaros um, would, would serve for two weeks. There was one mishmar co um, called Bilga. And, 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 and the Mishnah tells us that the, that the mishmar of Bilga was, was penalized. Why were they penalized? So before why were they penalized, how were they penalized? Um, so the, the, when, when you walked into the temple, 
um, you walked in from one end and you would always, if you if someone continued moving through the temple, which most people can only go up to a certain point, calling them can go a little further, and the high priest can go the furthest into the Holy of Holies. You'd be walking from east to west. When you came into the big courtyard where the altar was, and you're facing the west, so to your right is the north, and to your left would be the south. And when, when the new Mishmar came in, they would get a portion from the lechem hapanim, the showbread, and they would also get parts of sacrifices that, that they would get to eat from sacrifices that were sacrificed. So the new Mishmar that was coming in, they would get their, uh, their food on the more honorable side, which was the north side. And the, the Mishmar that was leaving, they would get their portions on the south side because they were already on their way out. The, the, the uh, Mishmar of Bilga, they were penalized and they were given their portions even when they came in on the south. So the Talmud asks, um, why, why were they penalized? Why were they penalized? So the Talmud gives two reasons. One reason is due to Miriam Bas Bilga, who became a heretic, because there was a, there, there was a, a, a daughter of Bilga, who became a heretic, joined the enemies of the Jewish people. The, the Talmud brings a, a fascinating, tragic story, which the Rebbe has another very fascinating talk about. Um, and because because she 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 became such a heretic, um, therefore, they were penalized. Second reason the Talmud says is because they 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 showed up late. They were late to their duty. Can you imagine you're serving in the temple of God and you show up late? So they were penalized and 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 and, and they were they were given something which was a form of embarrassment for them. And we're going to see soon that not only were they were they given their portion on the south when they be, came in to begin their uh, their week of uh, of duties, um, but we're going to see as well that the um, and it's going to become relevant soon that it says tabato kevua and chalina stuma that their ring which we'll discuss, was, was, was locked up, and their window was closed up. So those are another two things, that they didn't have access to certain conveniences that belonged to them, like every, like every other one of the 24 um, groups of Kohanim did. So now, the Talmud asks, why would they be punished for the fact that Miriam, the daughter of Bilga, became a heretic? Because Miriam became a heretic, well, the, the, the whole Mishmar gets punished. I mean, what did they do? They didn't do anything. I mean, so one person sins, they, the person sinned. So the Talmud says, when a child says certain words, we know that they learned those words from their parents, from their father and mother. So if Miriam was saying such heretical words, she must have picked it up in her house. So the Talmud asks again, okay, so maybe, so maybe, um, uh, Miriam's parents should be, should be uh, penalized. But the entire Mishnah should be penalized. So the, so the Mishnah says, so the, so the Gemara says, I want you to remember this because it's, it's also going to be relevant. Oi, woe is to a wicked one, to a wicked man. The oi and woe is to his neighbor. Which basically says that if when a person is associated with someone who is, is, is bad, is, is not good, then it rubs off on them. So the fact that the whole Mishmar was associated with this family, which obviously said negative things and heretical things, therefore the entire Mishmar was affected by it, and therefore they got they, they get punished. Now then the Talmud then the Talmud concludes the entire tractate because the Talmud the, the, the Talmud never concludes, and in general there's a, a a policy in Torah that we never conclude a subject with something negative. So then the, the tractate concludes by saying to, that just like Oyla Rasha, Oyla Shechene, what was to a wicked person and what was to his neighbors because his neighbors get affected. So, Tev Le Tzadik, Tev Le Good is to a Tzadik and good is to his neighbors. That if someone's a Shachin, a neighbor to a Tzadik, then he, uh, it's, it's, it's going to rub off well for him. As the verse says in the, in the book of Isaiah, of Yeshayo Anavi, Imru Tzadik ki tev, say that a Tzadik it is good for him. Kipri ma'alaleim yechelu. The fruits of their efforts they will eat. So we see by the fact that people are associated with the tzaddik, they end up getting to eat good fruits as well. So um, now the rabbi says that the fact that the Talmud has a whole discussion about the reason 
of, um, the, of, of, of the family of Bilga being penalized because of Miriam Bas Bilga seems to, seems to uh, imply that the primary reason why they were penalized was in fact because of Miriam Bas Bilga, the first reason, not the second reason that they came late. Now, one thing that we want to point out, because we're going we're gonna to explain this, is going to be a nuance that will um, guide us. Rashi says, Oy le Rasha, Oy le Shechenai. Rashi comment, comments on when the Talmud says, what was to a wicked person, what was to his neighbor? So Rashi adds, and toiv la tzadik, and for a tzadik it is good, demida toiv meruba. Because whenever we speak of goodness versus adversity or punishment, goodness is always manyfold more and manyfold greater. That's what Rashi says. And what's strange is that Rashi does not use the verse that the Talmud uses to demonstrate that. By saying, Imru tzadik say that tzadik is good, um, and then, primi alalehem yachelu, and they will eat an abundance of, uh, um, an abundance of fruit because they're near the tzadik. He doesn't say that. So Rashi's avoiding this, this pasuk, this verse for some reason. We're going to see that this is significant. And we can understand this all through understanding the other penalization which they received, and that was that Tabata Kivua and Chalina Stuma. That their ring was locked up and their and their window was 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 sealed shut. What's this referring to? So Rashi explains it this one way, and Tosfus explains it in a different way. Um, and Rambam explains it in a different way. I'm sorry, and R- Rambam explains it in a different way. Rashi says these rings were, when you can see this in many pictures, if you if you look at pictures of the uh, of of the uh, base of Migdash or diagrams of the of the uh, temple, you'll see that when you walk in to the right side, you'll see 24 rings, um, which were attached to marble on the floor, and these rings, Rashi says, um, that they were used in order to put around the neck of the animal. So that was it was a mechanism that was that was used in order to um, in order to hold down the animal when it was being slaughtered. So it was a ring that would swing up and then swing down, something to that effect. And they locked um, um, Bilga's ring, so they would have to use someone else's ring, but they didn't have their own ring to use as a form of uh, of embarrassment because of the one of the two reasons that we mentioned. And um, and then every mishmar, every a watch of Kohanim, of the 24 watches, each also had, they had sort of, sort of, sort of like a cubby. They had 24 windows, they called it, because they were in, in the walls, um, and where they would keep their their chalif, their slaughter knife, to shecht. And the the window for Bilga was, was sealed closed. Um, again, they had to keep it somewhere else, or they had to borrow maybe uh, the slaughtering knives. Um, and that was, a, that was a form of penalization. Now, Rambam says, it gives a different explanation to both of these things. He says that the ring refers to other rings, rings upon which they would hang the animal after it was slaughtered. And they wanted to skin the animal. So in order to skin the animal, they would hang it up. So the ring that belonged to Bilga, they closed up. They didn't let Bilga use their ring. And the windows were not windows for their slaughtering knives, but the windows were windows for where the Kohanim each kept their special clothing that they had to wear when they did service in the temple. It was made out of linen four linen garments, and they had win- these these compartments that they were able to keep their clothing in. Bilga's uh, compartment was taken away and they had to keep it elsewhere. Now, so why is it that Rashi explains it one way and Ramam explains it another way? It's not just random. There's a reason why they're explaining it this way. So there's a difference in explanations for this reason. Rashi uh, demonstrates to us that the, the both penalizations, both the ring and the uh, window were both associated with what? With slaughtering. As Rashi explains it, that there's a ring that held the animal when it was being slaughtered, and there was the window that held the slaughter knives. So Rashi specifically says that they were penalized in regards to things that related to what women can do as well. Because in the process of bringing an animal for a sacrifice, a coin had to do almost the entire uh, service. There were many steps to bringing a sacrifice. The coin had to do all of them, almost all of them, except for slaughtering. Slaughtering an Israelite or a woman was allowed to slaughter if they wanted to slaughter, which is very interesting. So, so Rashi is basically um, indicating that because a woman, Bilga, a Miriam, the daughter of Bilga, she became a heretic. So therefore, we gave them a penalization which was associated with women as well. A penalization that reminded them 
that this has to do with um, with, with with something to do with women, and therefore both elements here, the ring and the uh, window, he describes as things that are associated with women, because women were allowed to slaughter animals. They weren't allowed to do, they weren't allowed to skin animals. So that would not have been a penalization that was associated with women. The Rambam um, specifically says that they were penalized with matters which were unrelated to women. Unrelated. Why so? So why does Rashi adamant that it should be about things related to women and Rambam is adamant that it shouldn't be, the penalization is not about things related to women? So Rashi believed that the, that the watch, that this that their watch of Bilga was fined that with matters associated with being, why, why was the entire, why did we just say that the entire, um, this entire watch was penalized? They didn't do anything. But because they were neighbors with Miriam, with, the, with Bilga, and that Miriam, the daughter of Bilga, and the parents. Um, so, so therefore, there's an external association between the two. So therefore, it was it had to do with a woman. And therefore, the penalization was also related to something to do with a woman. So the, the, the fine, the connection of the, of the penalization to the issue was an external association. And there was a woman that uh, was the heretic. So therefore... We gave that, they, they were penalized in a way that it was associated somehow with women. But the Rambam believes that neighbors, when people are neighbors, it's not just an external relationship that they have, but they have a much deeper relationship, which would mean then that the whole watch of Bilga had a much deeper connection and, and relationship with Miriam, the daughter of Bilga, and her parents uh, than the way Rashi describes it. So therefore, the Rambam says that the penalization was on matters that were not associated with women. To demonstrate that this is not some external uh, relationship, that a woman is the one who became a heretic, so we give them a punishment that, with something that has to do with women. <clears throat> no, there was a much deeper association. Because negativity of a neighbor penetrates his neighbors significantly in a much deeper way. And therefore, Rambam wants to avoid explaining the penalization as a somewhat superficial penalization. So here again, now we're seeing something that has to do with nefesh, with character of people, with their experience of who they are as a person. And again, with neighborliness of people, in, not, not in regards to their property, but in regards to themselves and how they affect each other. And here again, we see how Rashi and Rambam differ because all coming down to how deeply connected neighbors are to each other. And now we can understand, based on this, we can understand why Rashi uses the rationale. Well, Rashi insists that when he says, Tov, that, that just like the, the Talmud says, O the Rosh of the Shechina, woe is to a wicked person and woe is to his neighbor. So then, it's, then the Talmud says, the Tov the Tzadik, Tov the Shechina, uh, good to a Tzadik and good to his neighbor. So Rashi does not use the verse that the Talmud uses to confirm it's good for a tzaddik and good for his neighbor, but he uses a, a logical rationale, right? He says, because a meruba mida teva, uh, or, or he says mida teva meruba, because goodness is always more plentiful, is always more abundant. Why? Because when you look at the verse that the Talmud uses, which the Talmud says the verse <laughs> that says, emar uh, tzaddik ki teiv, um, say to Imru uh, Imru Tzadik Itayv. Say of a Tzadik that he is good. Kipri um, Malalehem Yerchelo. So really, this is it starts by saying say to a Tzadik singular that he is good, or that it is good for him, and then it says Kipri Malalehem because the fruits of their efforts Yerchelo uh, they will eat. Wait, it should say because the fruits of his efforts he will eat. Why does it jump from singular to plural? Which is very strange. So, so the, the Rambam says, you see, because when a tzaddik is good, not only does it remain good for a tzaddik, it becomes good for everyone around him. Because there's a deep connection between a person and his neighbors. So it translates into many more people, this, this, this benefit. <clears throat> so Rashi is not of that opinion. He doesn't believe that. So therefore, he didn't quote the verse, which is an explicit demonstration of the, of, 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 of the Rambam's perspective on the connection that the level of connection that neighbors have to each other.
So why does Rashi in, in, at all add a mida toiva maruba that when it comes to good, there's, it's more abundant? He should just not even mention it because that's already alluding to the idea that there is that if that that when it comes to goodness, there is maruba, there is more. It's spreading to more people. So the um, So, so for this, we have to dive a little bit more spiritually and understand what good is and what and what evil is, and what negativity is. Um, when the when the watch of Bilga was penalized, they were penalized with an external form of embarrassment. That's Rashi's opinion. Um, it didn't take away in any way. It didn't affect any in any way their service. They were able to do the entire service. It's just that there were symbolic uh, forms of embarrassment for them, but it didn't actually right impact them significantly. Um, and the reason why is because, and this is a very deep and beautiful idea. Anything that a Jew does which is negative is always external to their inner self, to their inner and true self. It's always external. It's that they got lost in a confusion of valuing something which has no value. And in their delusional state, they they, they bought into this and they got caught up in it. But their deep inner core self, their inner core divine soul always knows and is always aligned with God. It's just that that it's it's not always that we are living consciously on that level. And so therefore we we fall into states of confusion and delusion. So therefore, anything negative is external. And that's the reason why any punishment um, is always just external. As Rashi, as Rashi argues over here, that the punishment for the family of Bilgo was an external punishment. It was just a, it was just a, a ceremonial uh, form of uh, slap on the wrist. But it didn't actually impact their, their full dedication to service in the temple. No, no element of service was taken away from them. So... And why is punishment always external? Because punishment is dealing with external issues that a person has. And that's why the, the Talmud actually says that, that Hashem shall trouble you on, 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 on this day. That Hashem will trouble you with a punishment on this day. What's on this day? On this day that He troubles you. Meaning that, that punishment is never eternal. It's just a temporary thing to deal with a, a temporary external issue. And in general, negativity is external to the uh, to, to the essence of a Jew, and therefore, if the if the negativity is, then the punishment which is coming to cleanse for the negativity is also something which is just dealing on an external, on a topical level. But good, good is the essence of who we are. We are essentially good, and good is the inner, eternal good that lies within every single one of us. And goodness is eternal because goodness is true. It's not delusional, it's real. And anything that's real is absolute, it always is. Um, and therefore, its effect is eternal. And that's the reason why Mida Toiva Meruba. So Rashi says the punishment it was external. Because any wrongdoing a Jew does is always external to their true inner self that they got out of touch with. But Mida Toiva, but anything good. Meruba, that is e plentiful, that is eternal, that lasts forever. Now, this is also an explanation, just parenthetically, the Rebbe doesn't mention this here, but that's the reason why, um, although for thousands, we were in, go- in exile for thousands of years, and we talk about how all of the goodness that we have done adds up so that we're getting closer and closer to Mashiach. So people ask, but well, what about the negativity that we've done, the wrong things we've done? That also adds up. And the answer is it does not add up. Because negativity is external, it doesn't have eternal sustenance. Because it's not actually a genuine expression of who we are, and therefore it doesn't sustain. It's not sustainable. So therefore, it does last for a while, but it peters out. Goodness is eternal. So, and and, and the Rebbe continues to explain this idea spiritually. When we say oy le rasha, oy le shchena, what's the word oy? Oy, right? When we say the word oy, it's an expression of pain. When a person says oy in the pain of the acknowledgement that I have done, I had done navera, I sinned, I did something against the will of God. Right? That oy is an expression of teshuva, of drawing close to God, like, oy, I have regret. And the oy is a form of breaking down the negativity that I got myself in touch with, which is a process which we call sore meirah, removing myself from negativity. 
because there, there, there are two movements through which we, 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 um, we serve God. One is through Tzor Mayras, removing ourselves from negativity. The other is Asay Tov, doing good. Um, tov, on the other hand, right, as opposed to Oy L'Rash, Oy L'Shchena Oy, which is a form of an expression of Sor Meira, removing ourselves from Ra, from negativity, right? Asay Tov, doing good, Tov, is breaking negativity, but not through Oy, of removing myself from negativity, but from Tov, by getting engaged in goodness. And what motivates a person to be engaged in good things is that they're in a state of joy, not in a state of Oy, but in a state of joy. And that is through the movement of Asay Tov, of, of doing positive things, not protecting myself from negative things, but from actually um, doing positive things. The, the idea we discussed earlier of Bar Metzra, where you have two neighbors living next to each other, and a buyer comes and buys the neighboring field. Why do we tell the, the guy who bought the field? We tell the guy who bought the field, listen, you bought the field, you want that field, we're going to ask you to do something which is very difficult for you. By nature, it's very hard for you, and that is to give up the field to the neighbor because it's to his benefit. To literally give up that field simply for the benefit of another Jew. Right? So that's Sur Meira. Like, stay away from doing something that will that will take away from benefiting another person. And then you have the second example we gave of Taste with Shabbos. Taste with Shabbos is not Sur Meira, it's Tov. It's extending the goodness of Shabbos into the mundane week. So we see there are two movements that we have that, that can be expressed through our neighborliness. Just like we have Oy la Russia, Oy la Shchenai, what was to a wicked person, what was to his neighbor? Toiv la Tzadik, Toiv la Shchenai, good is to a Tzadik and good is to his neighbor. And the Rebbe concludes with this. He quotes the Megala Amukais. It's a great Torah scholar who lived about uh, um, 400 years ago. And he writes that the, the month that we are approaching in a couple of weeks is the month of Elul. That's the month before Rosh Hashanah. It's a very significant month. And we, we discussed a couple of weeks ago that Elo is the acronym for Anilo Doi Dividoi Dili. I'm to my beloved, my beloved is to me. That's a well known acronym, but it's an acronym for another for a few other verses as well. And one of the verse one of the statements, the, the, the uh, statements that it's a that it's an acronym for, which the Magal Amukas states is Oi le Rasha ve oi le shenai. If you take those words and you take the first letter of each of those words, you have El Oi le Rasha. Ve oi, ve oi l'shchenei. You have Elul. What's the connection between oi l'roshav oi l'shchenei to Elul? So the Rebbe says that the Zohar tells us that there are three months which are associated with our forefather Jacob, Yaakov, Yaakov Avino. Which ones are they? They're Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan. Then, just like Yaakov got three months associated with him, Esau, his twin brother, should also have three months associated with him, which technically he does. But he lost some. Um, he has Tammuz, the next three months, Tammuz, of and Elul. But Elul was not given to him. And, um, and he even lost most of the month of Av. Oh, he only got the first nine days, which we call the nine days of mourning. But after the first nine days, the, then, then what happened was, through the Avoida, through our service of God in the month of Elul. By saying oi to the Russia, to the negativity of what we've done in the past year. So we break down our negativity through Sor Meira, staying away from evil. Not only do we impact the month of Elul, but it even impacts the neighboring month, which is the month of Av. So much so that we conquer, we take back from Esav most of the month. All the way, backtracking until the ninth of Av. Um, and the purpose of breaking down negativity is also to increase good, that we do more good. So through breaking down, so the rabbi concludes by, by saying that through breaking the negativity of the nine days, breaking down the negativity of the nine days, we end up reaching to not the month of Av, but the month of Menachem Av. So the month of Av is very often referred to as Menachem Av, consolation of Av from our Father, consolation from our Father. Who's our Father? Our Father is God. That God should bring us consolation, as we know that Mashiach was born on Tisha B'av. So, the kind of, so in the darkness is always embedded the deepest level of, uh, of light and salvation. So um, we, 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 our, our, our efforts of breaking down the negativity through the nine days brings us to a level where we experience nechama, consolation from Av, from our Father. Not only that, we go right into the Shabbos after Tisha B'Av, which is this coming Shabbos, which is known throughout the Jewish world as Shabbos Nachamu, the, the Shabbos of Consolation, because we, the Haftorah begins with the words, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, 
console, console my people, that we reach then the level of from Menachem of that our father consoles us to a double consolation, which then takes us to the following Shabbos where the Yavtorah is, Anoichi, Anoichi, Yehu Menachem, Chem, I, I will console you, Hashem says, that Hashem himself will console us. And that leads us into the month of mercy, which what's the month of, month, month of mercy? It's the month of El, because in El we know that what pervades throughout the month of El and is accessible to all of us is the Yud Gimel Midas Harachim and the 13 attributes of mercy. And we know that the 13 attributes of mercy are a level within God, which is beyond and higher than all forms of um, accounting and, and consideration. God just says, I am merciful and I'm going to forgive. And it's the prelude, once with the month of El and the month of uh, mercy is the prelude to us experiencing on Rosh Hashanah, Aksiva v'chasim atayv, that God writes and seals us for a good year, and that we all, uh, and that we are all written in the Sefer Shel Tzadikim, in the, bo- in the book of the righteous.